Welcome back to Open Line tonight. We're talking to the ladies from Beacon Impact, kind of an offshoot of the Beacon Center, uh, talking about some legislation that has passed and will be signed into law come July 1st that will help people who are transitioning out of prison be able to work towards getting those licenses they need in order to get a job and sustain themselves and hopefully stay out of the criminal justice system. Lucy's on the line. Want to take your call? Hi, Lucy. Hey, y'all. Hi. Go Hi. ahead. Hello. Well, I just want to say first, congratulations, young ladies. I am, I am proud of you, really am. Uh, I don't so agree nice. with everything that the Beacon Center says sometimes. I kind of growl a little bit. <laughs> For the most part, uh, I think that you guys in the Beacon Center are, are trying. And, and that's, that's more than what I see a lot of other people, a lot of other people do. Uh, a lot of people aren't exposed to people that are different than them. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned, uh, all my life that some people just get in a spot. Uh, I've been around junkies, prostitutes, uh, people that have been thrown away by society for decades. And it was the same old grind over and over. Looking at what y'all have just done with this, it just shows me I'm a conservative. I am tired of throwing my money away on something that Einstein said. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same result, mm -hmm. that's the definition of crazy. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate y'all approaching this. Now, one of the things that I saw was a young man that I know that had a 35-year sentence for uh, armed robbery, and he did assault the person he robbed in the convenience store. They put him on a 10-year probation. He spent 20 years in prison. He went in prison at 16. Wow. And it was like him being 16 years old and being dropped on the streets again. And mm -hmm. he had to walk the narrow ch uh, chalk. Mm -hmm. But there was a program that came out that paid his employer $65,000 to hire wow. him because he was a prior felon. And listen to what I'm getting ready to say. He couldn't get a job before because he committed armed robbery on a convenience store. Store. He got a job handling cash at a convenience store for that, uh, uh, you know, as a job because of that program. And he's been going to work and he's been maintaining. He has to. He's on probation. He's on a tight leash. But people saw what a, a great kid he was. And he's just had uh, done he uh, an idiot thing in life. And my here's my question for y'all: You've got kids that will do stuff, juveniles that will go through a neighborhood and bust out and do yeah. fifteen thirty thousand dollars worth of damage to windows. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see instead of letting them out, I would really like to have those teens assessed on their maturity levels and their social skills before you let them back out. Because a lot of people say, yeah, you need to lock up these teens when they do that. You're letting them out and they keep coming back to the neighborhood. Do y'all think that there's a program needed to do them some mental health help? Well, Don't hang Lucy, up. Okay, Lucy, you let us right into what was going to be my next question, so thank you. You all are working on juvenile justice reform yes. and this is huge across the board. It's very important and thank you, Lucy, for calling. I think you chewed up with a lot of really mm -hmm. great points. Um, we did pass uh, a juvenile justice reform bill. It was the governor's bill actually this year, but we were big advocates for it. And I'll, I'll let Stephanie go into detail, but one of the issues we have in the state is we have a hodgepodge of juvenile justice laws. You know, what a, a juvenile sentence within one county can drastically different from, really? yeah, it can be very different from what somebody oh. in another county gets. And so uh, there's definitely a lot of need for reform when it comes to juveniles. Mm -hmm. uh, and this bill is pretty comprehensive. I think it touched on a lot of these things. Yeah. So one of the things that we found in the juvenile justice system is that it's often a pipeline to the adult prison. Yes. Mm -hmm. and and we have to be really thoughtful about how we treat teens when they're in that program and it determines how they end up at, at the end when they're adults. Mm -hmm. And um, what the bill did was it allows for some research and some data to be collected that's currently, we don't know what our problem is yet in Tennessee because we don't have the data to, to show what our issue is. But what we do know is that somebody that was a juvenile that was convicted of a crime in one county in Tennessee was being treated completely different than a juvenile that was convicted of the same crime in another county. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have these different sentences and 
different punishments for the same crime just in different counties in the state. And it really takes a, a community to collaborate together, both the judges, the DAs, um, the uh, corrections uh, facilities, and all of the advocates to get together to discuss um, how can we make this a little bit more uniform across the board, and how can we stop them from going from the juvenile pop or the juvenile prison to the adult population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories that we heard when we talked to Lindsay Holloway, one of our heroes that we work with and advocate for, um, she found that when she ended up in prison, her crimes kept escalating, and she was a teen when she first got convicted, because what she learned in prison was just more people to do crimes with and more uh, ways yes. to commit crimes, and nobody treated her her real issue which was addiction at the and if they had treated that at a much earlier time she may not have gone on to to commit the crimes that she did mm -hmm. um, so she's now been clean and um, has not committed any more crimes once she finally got the treatment that she needed and for time. some teens that is mental illness is what really needs addressed for some teens it's addiction mm -hmm. for some teens it's that they have no family right, right. they have they have raised themselves mm -hmm. the best way they know how right. and there's there's really no black or white here there's so much gray in the answers how do we fix this? Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind when it comes to juveniles too is about 70% of kids who have a parent in prison will end up in prison themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these kids, this is a family problem. They end up serving time with their dad in the same cell or with their wow. mother. And so they don't have a family unit or someone that's really supporting them. And that's one thing that Lindsay actually credits is she had a strong family that helped her, but so many people don't have those resources mm -hmm. and people that will step in. Or even if they do, sometimes they've exhausted that yeah. and they're no longer going to help them. So we need to make sure we have diversion programs, treatment programs in place to catch these people early on so that their crimes don't escalate. She went from a 16-year-old cheerleader who was smoking pot to sticking needles in her arm. You know, her, mm -hmm. what happened really escalated and it could have been stopped early on. Wow. Let's jump back to the lines. We have Tanisha waiting ever so patiently. Hi, Tanisha. Thanks for calling in tonight. Hi. Um, I do have a question. Um, what does, uh, does this program help people? Like, I know of a friend that has... Um, has been in the system, it's her first felony and, and misdemeanor, but she suffers from PTSD and depression and she's trying to get back into the workforce, but she's having doors closed at every turn. And I'm just wondering if this program helps people like that have that in her, her felony has, her felony has been uh, passed like this happened in 2010 and she hasn't been in any trouble since mm -hmm. and so she's just having a lot of trouble getting past mm -hmm. that first hurdle of having the door slammed in her face is there any does this program help with that so we're back to talking about the fresh start legislation yeah. obviously mm -hmm. um how could her friend go about maybe finding a better way so one thing that she can do with this legislation is you could actually um, have her go and petition a board for the profession that she wants to to get involved in she could also, um, if it's not an, if it's not a nonviolent um, felony, so if it's a violent crime, mm -hmm. um, they are excluded from the legislation. However, that doesn't mean that there's no path forward. It just means that this would not have an exemption for that crime. So if it is a um, if it is a nonviolent felony, then um, she could use this bill to. Uh, to petition a board. So basically it sounds like, Tanisha, maybe your friend says, you know, I think I'd be a great hairstylist, or I think right. I would be a great realtor, or I think I would be whatever. Right. And then start pursuing that board and say, is this something I can obtain? And then mm -hmm. I will go back and I will get the education to do so, but you give me the green light now, yes. right. that if I jump through all these hurdles, you're gonna give me the thumbs up and the license. Yes. And right. just a note, one thing to keep in mind for people who are looking uh, are the TCAT schools around town. So the Tennessee College for Applied Technology, they offer educational components for a lot of these fields that require license a lot of the trades uh, and they have a really wide range of different mm -hmm. degrees and programs you can go through. I got to tour one and was blown away. I thought it was all going to be woodworking or machines and it sure. was nothing of the sort. There was such really? a wide range of things you could learn to do there and I think uh, most Tennesseans are actually able to get free education at those for two and it's years. Called what? Uh, they're called TCAT schools, Tennessee College for Applied Technology. And so for people who are really trying to get back on the mm -hmm. right path and don't have a lot of resources, that's something to keep in mind. That's great information. Okay, mm -hmm. Tanisha, I really hope that helps you and your friend. Thank you for calling in tonight. Um, that's what this is about, is just letting folks learn about this. And I yeah. know this this actual legislation goes into effect July 1st. The governor mm -hmm. signed off on it. That's when all the new bills go into effect. Are the boards ready if Tanisha's friends calls and say, okay, I want to make sure. They're not going to be like, well, what are you talking about, <laughs> huh? They should be ready. They all know that this bill is coming. They, we've, Like I said, we had discussions with the different state agencies prior to its passage. And um, ultimately, at the end of the 
the day, I think everybody agreed this was a good step forward and will help a lot of people um, get into a lot of professions in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Lucy helped us jump into the juvenile justice reform that you guys have mm -hmm. worked on. I know there's another piece of legislation you all worked on this past session. Yeah, so one thing we've noticed when you're dealing with the criminal justice system is often it's funded based off the amount of people in it in a certain division. And all that does is create an incentive to have more people in it. Instead, mm -hmm. we would like to start seeing the system structured so it's funded based on outcomes. And so we passed a pilot program. Again, I'll let Stephanie dig into the yeah. meat of the bill because she's been working on this all session. But it's really exciting that kind of flips that uh, for parole departments. And so we'll we, um, our coalition for sensible justice, with all the organizations that I was talking about mm -hmm. prior, um, we actually got the legislature to um, to appropriate a million dollars for this pilot program. And what we're really hoping to do, it's it's coming out in an RFP through the Department of Corrections uh, in the early fall, mm -hmm. and it will be available to any sheriff's department or probation department in the state to apply. There's going to be four grants. Each of them is $250,000 a piece. And if your sheriff's department, your local sheriff's department, wants to create a pilot program to reduce recidivism in their county, they can apply through this RFP to get one of those grants. Um, they have to agree to a certain set of metrics to make sure that they're actually reducing recidivism in their county. Mm -hmm. And they can be workforce development programs, addiction treatment, any of the broad range of things that can help people not reoffend. Sure. And um, and once those pilot projects or grants are awarded, then if they, they get 75% of the funding up front and then they get the remaining 25% only if they reach the benchmarks that they agree to. And so this so. is interesting. So sheriff's departments are usually in charge of the jail in yep. their county. Mm -hmm and people who go to jail are people who are awaiting trial yes. or people who have been sentenced for a misdemeanor for a year or less, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. correct? So we're talking about people with low-level offenses mm -hmm. who are sitting in jail, hoping to come out pretty quickly mm -hmm. and do better, not return to jail. Right. So right. that's what we're thinking about when you're thinking about reforms within the jail, yes. mm -hmm. programs to help them during that year or so. And we know that they know their prison population better mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. we could ever know it. And so allowing those sheriff's departments to come up with the program that they would like to create and look at other counties and see what's working and what's not working, then they can create that program and um, and really set the benchmarks on how they're going to improve their county and totally save their taxpayers yes. money in the long run. Like Two hundred fifty thousand is, is a lot of money, but also it's not when you're thinking of everyone sitting in jail oh, and trying to create times a program. That you yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's look ahead to the next legislative session. It'll be here before we know it. What are you guys looking at? Well, as Stephanie referenced a little bit of ago, yes. one major problem in Tennessee that we're facing is the issue of bail. We have a lot of people who are in jail. Mm -hmm. They've not been convicted yet. They're, they've been charged. Uh, they've not had a trial yet, and they can't afford to get out. And if they cannot afford to get out, they can't afford to pay their bail, or they cannot get someone to put their bail up for right. them, then they sit and they languish there until whenever their trial comes up. Um, and that's a huge issue. So we're really looking at digging our teeth into that and trying to have a pretty massive reform. And, and how do you, I guess, balance between keeping the community safe and keeping the right pre people, violent people, people who need to remain behind bars until their case can go to court, and, and people who, you know what, let's, let's let them out and let's monitor them. Yeah. How do you find that balance? Well, the problem is we're not doing that right now. So mm -hmm. it's not based on who's more likely to be a threat to society, whether or not you get bail or not. It's, it's based on how much money you have. Do right. you have money to get out? Do you not? It's really only a few s select people who don't get access to bail. So otherwise, we're not basing that on a real public threat anyway. So we need to actually assess it in that manner and make sure that those people who actually are violent, that are a threat to society, don't get bail and stay there. But those who aren't, are able to get out and keep working, their lives don't fall apart while they're sitting in jail. Because if you're sitting in jail waiting for your trial, right. you're going to lose your job, mm -hmm. your kids have to go somewhere, uh, your bills are going to fall behind, you're probably going to lose your house, and then even if you're proven innocent at the end of the day, you've lost people your are life. Lost that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't think about that. The people who are found to be not guilty, mm -hmm. and then what? They've, They've already been, been destroyed. There. Yeah, right. interesting. Well, I do think it's really important that we make sure that we're not talking about violent offenses in any way, right. um, shape, or form. I think what we're talking about is let's do a risk needs assessment and find mm -hmm. out what is the root cause of why that person is there. And once we find out what that is, if it's addiction, then we get them treatment for that. If it's mental health issues, then we can get them treatment for that. If it truly is that they committed a crime and it's a violent crime and they need to stay in jail, then that's exactly where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think we're spending so much money that could be spent on those mental health and addiction treatment programs on just keeping that person somebody, in prison. Yeah, somebody right. locked up. Mm -hmm. Okay. We gotta take another quick break. We'd love to hear uh, from you right after this break. Go ahead and give us a call. 615-737-PLUS is the number to call if you'd like to chime in on this topic. Stay with us. We're coming right back.